so uh, good afternoon, or probably better, um, good evening. Um, so I'm um, here this time um, uh, to explain and to talk about the M plus, of course. Um, but before I do this, or maybe um, to do this, I thought the best thing is that I um, explain a little bit other museum projects the, museum, uh, the, the office has realized in the past years. Um, because I think they illustrate the best um, the way we approach projects. We think about cultural buildings, we think about buildings, about architecture, about people, about cities. Um, and in general, they describe best the way we work. And I thought the M plus should, should be at the very end of this, because then it's probably easier for you to read the still relative abstract plans we are facing and we are working with right now. And it will help to illustrate a little bit the um, uh, dry uh, model shots, diagrams, and um, still to be developed renderings. Um, we are um, shuffling around between Basel and Hong Kong in the last weeks. You cannot talk about the M plus um, if you have not mentioned the very first museum project of Herzog und Dommel, which is the Goetz Gallery in Munich. And um, it's a very small gallery building, actually in the garden of a private villa in the outskirts of Munich. And um, it's a very important collection, um, mainly art, or it was at that time mainly art from the 60s, minimalist art. Um, but it grew a lot until uh, now, and um, it was one of the first um, buildings uh, Jacques and Pierre were able to realize um, as a museum, but also um, as an international project. It's very radical and simple in its section, and um, that's the trick also, and, and that's important for you to understand, which is basically, um, of course, this is in a single family house area, so you cannot build very high. Um, so in section, half of the building is actually buried underground. Yeah? So, and that's um, a way to establish two um, display spaces on one side. But the idea is that basically the way the light comes into the space is exactly the same, like for the top space, but also for the below space. So the below space is a, has a similar quality than the above space. And um, that's kind of magic and maybe relates a little bit also to what we're doing here at the M+. So an image of the top space, an image of the bottom space, and through the clear, clear story, you have the exact same light situation, although you are below ground. Other than that, it's a very simple uh, materialization of the building, which is also important. It takes on board the materials which are basically on site. The birch trees translate into birch plywood. The um, sandblasted glass tries to be, during the day, as close as possible to the birch plywood, making it more of a box, whereas then at night, when you get the gallery lights to glow, it starts to um, hover above ground. Nine years later, um, Tate Modern opened. And um, of course, Tate Modern um, is providing um, similar gallery spaces, slightly larger than the one we saw before, but very similar in concept. Um, they're white cube spaces. Um, whenever we can, we have natural daylight in them, top lit or clear story, like the Götz Gallery. Um, they're bigger in scale, obviously, um, but they're very simple, um, good spaces for art, for this kind of art, and for many other pieces of art. But what was really the real breakthrough in the Tate Modern was, of course, this move here. Um, the turbine hall of the existing power station, um, rather than um, keeping it as a monument or rather than filling it up with gallery spaces, um, we decided to dig it out, to clean it up, to take everything out what is in there, to literally gut the space and make it even more dramatic in its proportion, in its presence, in its monumentality, in a way. And this is only possible, you can only do that when you have the critical mass to inhabit these spaces. And in London, you do have the critical mass to inhabit the spaces. Uh, so the monumental scale of the space is basically narrowed down a little bit, or take the edges off, 
by the occupation of the people, which happens so nicely whenever they have these art installations, which are on a changing yearly rhythms called Unilever series, um, where they ask artists to do a site-specific installation, which is really only possible only in that space. Carsten Höller, for example, the slides where suddenly the entire turbine hall becomes like a huge playground. Or even maybe the most successful one, the Olafur Eliasson um, weather project installation, where people use the turbine hall almost like a beach, like an urban beach. You know, people picnicking there, playing soccer, um, or just lying on the floor enjoying this installation. So suddenly, a building becomes a truly civic space. It's totally public, it's totally accessible, and it can be enjoyed by everybody. And people come, you know, in many numbers. And it's not only a transformation of an abandoned power station, it is a transformation of an entire city district. Actually, it's a transformation of London, because the southern part of London has not existed before, in a way, you know. The northern part was very well um, disconnected, so to say, from the southern part, and people from northern London typically didn't go to the southern part. And suddenly, this whole area is booming. A lot of construction, commercial construction, residential construction is coming up in the proximity of the um, building of the institution. But also the cultural institutions, which were already on the river, get a new kind of um, life and energy and passion behind them. So it really transformed the city and the same thing I'm pretty confident will happen here in Hong Kong as well with the West Kowloon uh, Cultural District. We designed the building for two million visitors. That was the assumption they had. Two million visitors, quite a big number. But unfortunately or fortunately, five million per year came. So it's the most visited contemporary art museum in the world. And it is used literally sometimes like a tube station. And it has to expand. We noticed that very early on. And there was one space left where we could do a similar kind of move like what we did to the turbine hall, which are the oil tanks next to the building. They basically are an integral part of the power station. And they were fascinating to us from the very first site visit when we went down into them. And they are amazing spaces. Spaces, very raw spaces you want to use, you want to show art in. And the Tate also did improvise some uh, temporary art installations for a couple of days just to test these spaces, and the success was tremendous. For some of the art, they worked perfectly. So it was clear that this would become the foundation of the extension, and we already opened a year ago um, the tanks, so we finished basically the underground works, and we reactivated these oil tanks as art spaces. And it was a very minuscule and a very um, difficult task, and you might not see it, and that's exactly the point. You know, we went in there almost like secret agents, and we didn't want to bring our design in the foreground. We wanted to bring what the tanks were in the foreground, make them suitable for art and for people, but try to make it as integrated as possible. So the oil tank, which you saw before, looks like this now, with a fantastic installation, opening installation by a Korean, young Korean artist. And the second oil tank, um, we decided to take out the column grid, the original cast column grid, and replace it by um, the maximum affordable structural span, so to say. So we have four very big columns. But it's interesting because this space will be primarily used then for performances. And the four columns, only with a little bit of light in the right position, form a stage. You know, nobody would dare to step onto this surface. It literally creates and defines a very clearly defined stage. So with very subtle methods, four columns and light, you can create space, you can create a very um, precise performing space. Sometimes we had to discover things, so this is something which was never accessible. This is, a, this is now the real oil tank. This is where the residue of the oil would go. So it was very dirty and oily, and we just basically cut an opening into it and open it up, and it becomes a fantastic space, not for a lot of art, but for some art, for um, acoustic, for light, for these kind of things. Um, some installations, some kind of pieces have a perfect fit of these spaces. So the foundation was done, and we were all wondering how do we continue above ground? What could that be? 
What could this become? And it was a long journey. And this is also very typical for our process in work of working and thinking. Sometimes it takes a long time until we get to the final result. We try many, many, many things. These studies are informed, as you can see, from the oil tanks, from the very beginning. At the very beginning, still very literal. And it kind of dissolves, in, evolves almost into something which um, makes much more sense urbanistically, programmatically, and is always developed in a very close relationship with our clients and with consultants. And one thing we also found out at the Tate Modern is that the circulation space became extremely important because the circulation space was large in scale and it was uh, more and more used basically for education purposes, learning purposes, and so on. So for the extension, it was clear that this is not only about display, this is really bringing these three things together. Display, learning, and social activities. So I heard this before in a presentation, you know, a museum is a social hub, you know, it's a civic place, people come there, and this is exactly what also should happen here with the M+. So you have classic display spaces, but immediately adjacent to them, you might have a learning space, you might have a gallery space again, but you also have larger areas where you kind of really can dive deeper into the content and into the um, idea or the topics or the issues um, you want to discuss and you want to um, elaborate and research. And all of this is tied together by one stair, and this is like a ceremonial route, like an architectural promenade through the building, which we quite carefully orchestrated and designed, so you wander from one space to the other. And this is how the building looks right now, just a few days ago, actually. Um, this brings us to a very different museum, the De Young Museum in San Francisco in the Golden Gate Park. When we were... Um, had the opportunity to participate in this uh, competition, it actually was, we immediately were fascinated by the idea of doing a building in this amazing city, but also on this amazing location. And doing a building in a park, doing a large museum building in a park, um, was fascinating to us. The idea of weaving basically the artificial environment together with the natural environment to kind of bring them together, to integrate them, to literally weave them together and that the building would overarch and stretch out into the nature and vice versa, that the nature would deep, deeply penetrate the building and really be part of the experience, your museum experience, um, was fundamentally interesting for us. So you are in this building a long these courtyards along the nature, you are basically guided into the galleries. It's a kind of a natural flow almost. You don't need any signs. You just follow the path, so to say, given by the courtyards and by the openings in the wall, and you flow through this organism, um, which is, uh, then has always possibilities to reorientate yourself, to look over a courtyard or to look out into the park, um, or to basically um, be in these gallery spaces. And the other thing, which was very interesting for us was that, yes, they do want 20th century um, contemporary art galleries in a way, but they had a very diverse collection. And that was good for us. It was different than the typical task we had. You know, we have been working quite a lot on contemporary art museum, but non, not one museum was like this, where you basically have 20th century, 19th century, but you have also art from the Africas, from the Americas, from Oceania, you have rugs, and you have arts and crafts things, and you even have furniture. So suddenly you have to think very differently about these galleries, and you have to adjust the typical white cube, which we are so um, used to do, into something else. And we did this step by step almost, by adding, for example, um, a wooden ceiling um, to the gallery space, because if you have a wooden floor and a wooden ceiling, it is suddenly possible to paint the wall in any color you want. If you have a white ceiling, it's very difficult to just put a line here and stop with the paint. Where do you stop? You know? But with this, it's clear. Same for the door frames. The threshold is clearly defined when you move from one gallery in the other. Um, we also, unfortunately, you can't see this here, a little bit maybe, the flat skylight suddenly becomes an extruded skylight. So it was literally a 
three-dimensional lantern sitting above the space and therefore creating a different spatial atmosphere and also a slightly different lighting effect, one which we know much more from the typical 19th century museums. And then at the very end, um, for the African and uh, early Americas and oceanic art, how can you display this kind of art? You know, it's very light sensitive, unfortunately. You cannot put it to the outside, but that's where it wants to be because that's where it was made. So suddenly you have to think about ways of encasing it without really encasing it. And we kind of came up with this idea of um, space tall vitrines, a landscape of vitrines, basically. Big, large vitrines, um, which almost are like little spaces. And suddenly you wonder a little bit, who's looking at whom? Is it the object looking at you, or you at the object? And that was a, guy, a game we were interested in, and we kind of um, liked to explore that a little bit. Density is also a question. How dense do you put these objects in the vitrines? Is it many of them? Is it few of them? Um, so we could really play with this quite a bit around. And then you have always these moments in the museum where you have a direct relationship, again, out to the park. So even in the light-sensitive spaces, you do this by this very narrow corridor-like space, but, but because it's glazed from the left to the right and floor to ceiling, you feel really like being outside and being part of the sculpture garden, uh, which you overlook from this window here. In the very extreme point, we have the tower, again, a feature which was there in the existing building. We kind of kept this tradition, but we also felt that the tower is important to understand where you are. This is such an amazing location, this park in the city of San Francisco, and only when you're up out in the tower, you understand the location, you understand the city, you understand the organization of the city. So suddenly this is not so much related to the museum and to the content, but it's very much um, caring about the place where you are and vice versa. So the tower is of course also a signal, a needle, an anchor, literally an anchor um, of the building visible from afar um, in the park. Um, we're traveling on the other side of America, so to the east coast, um, to Long Island, um, where we um, won the competition for a um, very local art museum. It's called the Parish Art Museum. And this museum, um, one of the reasons what we liked about it, they had a clear idea what they want to do. You know, they want to collect and show art which was created um, on Long Island, in Long Island. And when you look back into history, this is really where the entire um, contemporary American art um, kind of was developed. It's the birthplace of it. You know, it started with the guys in New York hearing about the Impressionists in Paris going out into nature to paint. So they said, oh, we have to do this as well. Where do we do this in New York? We do it in Long Island. So that's how they went out onto Long Island. And they stayed there. And there were a lot of um, um, interesting moments, I think, where also architects and artists and designers from Europe came to Long Island and exchanged ideas or just socialized with artists from there. So there was a true community uh, which built up and is still there. This artist community is still there, so you still find many important artists from uh, Barbara Kruger to uh, Barbara Bloom. I don't know, I just remember the two Barbaras now, um, to uh, Cindy Sherman, um, you name it. Chuck Close, of course, they're all there. Jackson Pollock in action. So we thought, um, if we want to design a museum for this place, we have to understand this community. We need to understand the context. So we went out and we visited these artist studios. We asked the client to organize a tour of all the studios which you can still visit. So Jackson Pollock studio, for example, uh, de Kooning studio, um, Lichtenstein studio. And it's interesting because they all um, had an amazing effect on us. Um, they're all very different. They're either converted garages like in Liechtenstein or they um, self-designed, de Kooning designed this thing here himself together with a little help of an architect um, or just um, took over barn structures almost. They, they, they all were very different in their typology but they all had one thing in common. They worked, they worked extremely well for the art somehow and for this pieces and to understand this is where the pieces are made and this is um, 
where the artist uh, create these pieces of work. And we felt that something of that would be good to have in the museum. Not every space can be like this, but that some spaces should have exactly that kind of feeling. We almost transported um, what we found there into the new design by basically copying literally the proportion of the space, um, but also literally the orientation of the space, and with that, literally the way the light comes into the space, because all of this are very important ingredients um, which make the, the, um, the atmosphere and the, the feeling and the look of a space. So we call these anchor galleries. They're, they're almost like um, found objects in a way, uh, recreated found objects, very awkward things, things you would never design if you would start from scratch. Um, but they happen there because they've been like this from the beginning. And these four would basically anchor the entire museum. So around these four anchors, we would then group all the other galleries and offices and lobbies and cafes and so on. And each of these other program functions would also be a house. So this way we would relate to the small scale of Long Island, to the villages, to the very different scale of this neighborhood. That was the resulting design. And then the crisis came. And the client only had a third of the original budget. But they had the site, and they had a third of the original budget. So they came back to us and asked us whether we can do something for them for a third of the money. And we said, sure, because these artist studios we visited, they are also very simple structured. And it must be possible to translate that into a larger building. So we started again with the most typical one, the one the most artists like there, which is the top typical north lit um, studio space perfect for working in. We found the right proportion of it. We basically um, created one role model. We put two of them next to each other, because when you have two, then you can combine them. You know, now you are able to enlarge the space, so to say. And then we basically just literally extruded them over the length of the site. And by the way, um, the roof, we noticed that if you have an overhang, which is good for many reasons, but it's also good for creating a space along the building relating to the nature and almost like an outdoor covered space, again, um, in a very direct contact with the setting in the landscape. And it worked also good for other spaces, for the auditorium, for the offices, for the storages, for the art loading, and so on. So this is all the same space which created this uh, very strong object in the landscape, almost like a piece of land art itself. A linear building placed slightly awkwardly on the site, but the, again, it's not us uh, placing it because we like it better like this. It is literally only because of the galleries facing north. So the entire building has to literally face north. So it's a very simple um, move which creates actually very interesting um, spatial conditions and relationship between, for example, the highway and the building. Yeah? So when you come down the highway this way, the building will look very different like when you come down the highway from this side. Talking about sustainability here for a moment, because you know, sustainability is always this huge topic. Um, when it comes uh, to these new buildings, and it's uh, always in every press interview, they ask you about sustainability. Sometimes sustainability is a very, very simple thing. Like here, for example, in this building, of course, we do geothermal. Not very difficult to do there. You're very close to the seawater. But we also do other very logic things, like, for example, solid vault, solid concrete walls, which is very special in America, because typically buildings there are um, framed structures, you know, so very um, not good ther thermally spoken. Um, a white roof reflecting off the heat, big overhangs over the few windows, but also overhangs over the walls. Even there, they help. Yeah. And these, all these measures are very simple measures, but make it building very sustainable without any additional solar cells, solar panels, or any kind of fancy uh, gimmicks. And it's also an extremely efficient building. It's probably the most, the most efficient museum building we have ever realized. Very simple, art comes in here, people come in here, and they meet in the middle in the galleries. And everything is gallery space or 
uh, lobby space or uh, administration space, and there's only this tiny wee bit of circulation space here in the back of house, but basically everything else is real usable space. So it's a, an extremely efficient model. Also the entrance, you cannot just make a door into this building, you have to do something else. So you enter through a gallery basically. The first space is already a gallery and off that gallery you go then into the zone where you have reception, store, cafe and so on. And then you go into the corridor. Um, and the corridor is not a corridor, it's wide enough to transport all the art, but it's also because of that wide enough to use it as an exhibition space. Um, the gallery space is very simple north light, but also a tiny little south light. So that's also very interesting because the entire space, so that's a small deviation from the original model, let's say. But because of that, the entire gallery becomes a light, a daylight mixing chamber. And really when the sun is out, the light is in a very different condition than when suddenly a cloud is passing by. The entire relationship to the sky was absolutely important because when we asked the artist, what do you like about being there? Why are you in Long Island? They all said it's because of the light, it's because of the big sky. This is what we like. And we said we have to bring this into the galleries. And we have north lights which are not screened. So you really see the sky, you see the clouds passing by when you're in the gallery, which is very unique and very direct. And also, um, I discussed this before with some other people. Um, there's only ambient light here. There's no track provision. And that is a huge step in America. America is for track lighting, for highlighting individual paintings um, versus general ambient light. And the client agreed with us that for this building it's appropriate to have only ambient lighting. But also here, here and then, not only relationship to the sky, but also relationship, of course, to the outside. And that's a quick word about the materialization. Cheap, it has to be very cheap. The cheapest concrete we could found is the one which is typically below, below ground. So it's foundation concrete, it's very rough. It is almost disgustingly rough, uh, still with splinters of wood hanging off it. But this is exactly what makes it so nice. It's very beautiful because it has a lot of texture. But when you touch it or when you want to sit on it, uh, it's important that it's smooth, and it's also important that it's possible. You cannot make this long building just like one monolithic facade and don't break down the scale. So we introduced this human scale. You can literally sit on the building, you can enjoy the building, you can um, occupy the building, so to say, and look over the landscape. So this is these small things which suddenly introduce a, a change of scale, which is very important to the architecture. And by cutting short, uh, one of these house shapes, you create also an outdoor veranda, which then again can be used for events, for installations, or just for an extension of the cafe. Miami. Um, I was specifically asked to add this to the presentation because it's brand new and it really only opened yesterday, uh, no, the day before yesterday. So um, what you see here is a bit of a sneak preview. Um, so actually interesting situation, not so dissimilar of what we have here in, in the M plus, uh, an empty piece of land, water, uh, some traffic, um, although the traffic in here is a little bit further away. But it's a very um, generic site, although super centrally located, it is somewhat generic and it was kind of difficult to find a starting point for this thing. And of course, the most obvious you find in the vernacular um, architecture and the interesting thing is that in Miami, the traditional houses are built on stilts for good reason. It's a hurricane place, they have a lot of flooding there, storm water and so on. So typically, houses are built on stilts. So it was clear for us that we also want to build this building on stilts. It has also other advantages. You really bring the art out of the flood ground, but also in Miami, people come by car. We don't want the car parking underground the building. We don't want the experience, the first experience you have of the museum uh, being an underground concrete box, which you could have in any shopping mall. So we felt it's important that the parking happens above ground, on ground, and you are already basically part of the park. 
And on top of that, we put then basically this um, lattice of um, concrete planks, which are almost like petrified wooden planks, um, which allow light and air into the parking and vice versa. So the arrival is already part of the experience of the museum. The gallery boxes itself, we pushed as high up as possible, but also as recessed as possible, so that you create this in-between zone. You create basically a public space which is comfortable to be, because that's the other driving factor. Um, besides the hurricane is, of course, the beautiful weather, the hot sun. Um, you want to be protected. And we had this idea that not only protecting the space, but also um, creating a microclimate by these hanging plants, which really do a difference to the actual protected environment when you introduce green plant material, because it has an additional cooling effect on the overall um, environment. Here you see the parking again below ground. So these are construction, um, not construction, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, it is still a little bit in construction, but I mean, this is how it was opened a couple of days ago. Uh, so landscaping still has to grow, but you can see quite nicely the two plates, the plates of the, above the parking, the roof of the parking, so to say, the second roof at the very top, and then the boxes nestling under this, almost like a little village. And always um, one recess, open glazed, one solid box sticking out, the recess, the glaze, as pushed back as possible so that you don't get any direct sun on these part, portions of the building. At night, this effect becomes even stronger. And it also explains quite nicely um, the idea of the um, gallery composition, which goes a little bit back to what we discussed before. How can we kill circulation space in a gallery layout? Yeah? So you come up here, and as you can see, all the in-between spaces, the so-called circulation spaces, are of that scale and of that size, that they are basically becoming gallery spaces. And we discussed with the curators a very nice idea that basically all these in-between spaces um, are basically the overuse spaces and they will be the home of the permanent collection of the museum. And then we will have more enclosed spaces which will have a more focused view either on artist specific installations or um, themes um, in the collection. And you also change materials when you go from the orientation space, like here, which is also very open and glazed, and you have always a relationship to your surrounding neighborhood, to the more um, concealed and precise focal spaces. So you go from white chipboard walls, which are almost leaning against the raw concrete structure, into wooden floor spaces with raw concrete walls. But again, you have windows which are um, lined in a wooden uh, material, so there's a certain warmth suddenly, a certain coziness, and you have even little chairs. So there's a moment of escape, you're in the building, and at the same time you can kind of escape, you leave the exhibition for a couple of minutes when you're just fully exposed to the view. Which brings us finally to Hong Kong, getting closer. Since 2005, actually, we were working on a project in, in the middle of Hong Kong. And um, for us, actually, this is a very important project um, because somehow maybe this is also one of the reasons why, why this M plus um, thing happened. You know? um, we got to know Hong Kong quite deeply and intimately, and we also got to love Hong Kong, and we really are very much um, enthused by this place. And, um, one of our um, greatest excitements of, is, of course, this specific um, place in the city. You know, it's in the heart of the city, but it's somehow a blind spot. If you think about it, um, it's in the middle between Lang Kwai Fong and Soho. It's surrounded by these needle high-rise buildings, and it's an oasis of tranquility and low-rise buildings. And actually, it was closed for many, many years. It was not accessible. It was like a rock in the heart of the city. People had to walk around. You only saw the solid uh, granite revetment walls. So for us, um, it was fundamentally important 
after we had a few other ideas which the public didn't like so much, and they were right. Um, so we can listen. Um, that the courtyard, and to keep the courtyard aspect of this site is absolutely important. And that even in this um, courtyard, there's again two courtyards, which are really um, very characteristic and give the entire site a lot of identity. But what we have to do, and that's what we understood quite clearly, is we have to open up the site. We have to make it literally a hinge, an urban node, people flowing through this um, oasis rather than flowing around. So you do the opposite of what this thing used to be. You open it up, you make it permeable, but you make it only permeable in very small and precise moments. No big openings, small moments of um, openings where you can enter this. And then you have these two courtyards, both have a very different character. The one is of the police station being much more open and active, whereas the one of the prison, for obvious reason, being more close and isolated. And we felt that this could be translated into a programmatic aspect of the site, which basically means that the cultural, arts and cultural program should be focused around this prison yard to create a certain activity there, and also the spaces there have a certain roughness and interesting um, character to them that you can use them quite nicely for art installations and so on. Whereas the lower part, which is already working quite well um, and look, looks a little bit more softer somehow, would be used for food and beverage, and then the rest is um, public and planned. So the ultimate goal, of course, is to bring everything together, to stitch it together and to make it one compound. And we only found two little spots in the entire site which can be occupied. There were no structures there, or only very, uh, just a little roof structure. So we demolished them and we kind of like missing teeth fill up these two holes, um, these two um, volumes. One dedicated to visual uh, culture at the old Bailey Wing, just luring or hovering above the existing revetment wall, not touching down. There's a gap there on purpose, so we stay away from the historic fabric. Also on the sides, we don't touch the historic buildings. We don't stick to them. We stay away. We have respect. We have this, um, they have a certain dignity, and so do the new buildings. And um, the one at the Abbasanal Road, which is dedicated to performing arts. So the two poles, so to say, forming also the two gates into the site and into the prison yard, and they actually become integral part of the thoroughfare of the site. So you walk under these buildings, so to say, through the site. The two gallery spaces, large gallery spaces in the old bailey wing, one with a small window to the, to the side, the other one toplit, and then um, in the F Hall building, which is this historic structure next to it, we kind of take on this structure and convert it also into a more rougher industrial um, art space. On the opposite side of the corridor, you find the Abbasanid wing with the multipurpose space behind this screen here. So also from the inside, you will always have a relationship out onto this courtyard. So also there, there's always this in-out relationship, which is very important. Um, and the lobby space of this space has, again, the relationship or the window to a bassinet wing. So it's kind of um, really bridging this gap. And under this building, we have this open air theater um, stair, which can be used for projections, all kind of installations, events, and so on. Again, you're protected from rain and uh, shine, um, but also you're kind of spatially framed. So the historic buildings suddenly, almost like a stage set, give this um, seating or these steps or this uh, um, um, ranked bleacher, so to say, um, a perfect setting and, and um, walls, almost like outdoor, indoor walls. Very, very special place. Which leaves us with the last topic, how do you materialize these buildings? Um, these buildings have to do a lot. I mean, they're housing these spaces, but they're also um, basically the, 
the energy plants for the entire site. So we can stay out of the historic buildings, we leave them as, as untouched as possible, and we use these buildings to feed the energy and to cool, uh, to produce the cooling loads um, we have to use in the um, historic structures. So the cladding had to do many things, had to be perforated, had to be open to establish uh, mechanical ventilation requirements, but also in front of the windows, you have to have a screen in Hong Kong. If you don't have a screen in front of the windows, you have to tint the glass quite badly or you make it reflective, as you can see everywhere in the city. So um, it, we kind of killed um, two birds with one stone, in a way, by developing um, this aluminum brick, um, which actually, in its size and proportion, um, relates to the existing granite walls. And it's made out of 100% recycled aluminum, so it's all the old car wheels uh, melted up and pressed into something much more useful, um, a beautiful cladding for our building. And then we use these bricks for the different uh, scenarios and only by cutting the nose basically on different levels, we create more bigger openings, almost like windows, to hardly any opening. And this is a view of the construction site right now. And this is how it will be in 2015, actually. Not too far away. Which brings us to the M+. I think you got already a, a good impression um, of, of our journey um, to get to these results. And um, I, I thought Colin's presentation was amazing um, and very complimenting when he named our proposal as being the open-ended, because I think that's what we intended from the very beginning. Um, that we don't want to uh, propose a design which is set in concrete. We wanted to propose something we can further develop um, with the client because we think we have to develop these kind of buildings together with the client. They cannot be just born in our kind of minds. So we need that exchange quite, quite desperately and I think that was also seen and noticed by the jury. Um, the site is amazing, for us especially, you know. It wasn't even there yet when we built Götz Gallery, for example, yeah. It was just a piece of water. Um, and only a few years later, it became already a piece of land. And now it's this amazing construction site with really establishing one of the major links here, which will again change Hong Kong and this whole area quite tremendously. And of course, this is the right site to build a museum and a Cantonese opera and other cultural buildings because this is where the future of the city will be because people will come by airport express or by train. But it is an empty piece of land. It's an engineered piece of land. So again, the same problem. Which shoulders do we rub against? You know, what, which, where's the friction? Where are the constraints? Where, where, where is the input from the outside? You know, if we don't have this input, what do we do? We have a blank piece of white paper. Very difficult to sketch something really nice on that. You know, you need some, some restraints, some input. And thank God, we found this very early on in the process, in the first workshop here in Hong Kong, where the technical department of the West Kowloon cultural uh, district authority told us like, by the way, there's an airport express tunnel under the site and the best thing you can do with it, you pour a three meter solid concrete slab above it and you just pretend it's not there. Yeah? <laughs> and we thought, hold on, there must be something there. And um, we had a great team on board, uh, namely Arup, which built this beautiful thing and um, we were soon provided uh, with images of this and Hold on, you know, it's actually a really interesting structure. It's not just a tube, it's just not a rectangular thing. You know, it really, it has steps. It, it, is, it is an architectural piece. It, is, it has a lot of power. It is, it is physical. And we've, one of the first models we built was actually the site including the airport express tunnel. And it's quite a beautiful topography. It's almost like a landscape. It's a found, found space, a found landscape, which we kind of try to dig out. And we felt that this is the best thing um, to create this much-wanted post-industrial space or this rough space 
something of an enormous scale, something of a very awkward design, something you would never, again, you would never design a stepped space like this. Why would you? It makes no sense. Yeah? But because it's the airport express, it might make some sense. And actually, when you think about it a little bit closer, it is actually quite interesting that it steps. It opens up possibilities which you have not thought about before. It's not a flat floor. It's elevated. It's, again, a topography people can walk over, or you can actually even use the topography to create something really special. So we were very happy with this because we felt this is a truly unique space, a very specific space, which literally um, roots, roots and anchors the building in the ground on the site, something which can only happen here and nowhere else. <coughs> so for the other galleries and for the rest of the building, it was clear for us that they should hover somehow above this found landscape. There would be an element, a an horizontal, very simple slab, and a vertical element for the administration and research areas and dine and food and beverage and so on. And this world, this more ephemeral kind of world, or Colin said, I think it's sky or cloud, uh, would hover about above the earthy one. And what we didn't um, do at the competition stage, and now I would say this is one thing which was tremendously negative about our design, uh, was that this horizontal slab and this vertical slab were not linked together at all, and we just cut this um, relatively arbitrary, as you can see here, round hole into the slab. We knew that we have to do this. We knew that we have to establish a visual rela relationship with the gallery podium. But what we did not know at that point um, that we also have to literally um, create and make this moment where the vertical slab and the horizontal slab come together um, at a very strong architectural moment in the building, um, an intersecting uh, knot of some sort. So this is the updated rendering of the found space, still in the makings. Um, not officially yet, officially you will only see this in January in the exhibition. Um, so, but it's now much clearer. You understand the vertical slab above. The vertical slab is expressed in this horizontal slab. You have these two cuts on both sides. And you have also, which is very nice, a bridge now um, over the found space. So again, um, all these different layers, earth in between and cloud, are stitched together in a much nicer way. It was always clear for us that this building cannot be an object. It has to be elevated. Um, and this is maybe through this criticism um, point two, I think it was. Um, what is the building towards Artist Square and towards the park? And that is our response. It is nothing, or it is very inviting, or it is very open. This is what we care about. So we think when you're close to the building, you don't want an object, you don't want to even be forced to look up and stare at this billboard, you know, it's very, it's not very comfortable. You just go straight like this and you go into the building because it's so open and transparent. And very important, you do this on both levels. You do this on the water level as well as, and this is now from Artist Square, from the Artist Square. So it's very inviting. People literally fall into the building and discover the building. And this is exactly, I think, what we want. You know? um, it really wants to be um, a very low threshold. We don't want to be elitist. You know? uh, people want, uh, should not feel intimidated by this building. They should feel invited by this building. And this is exactly what we intended by this very open ground floor plan, which is very clearly broken up in different program zones. But at the same time, you have tons of possibilities to circulate through it. And you either discover something which you like, a book or an exhibition in the found space, or a great temporary exhibition you want to look, or a movie you want to watch in the movie center, or something you want to learn uh, or make, um, or you just go out again on the other side to the park and you had five minutes of air conditioning. So it really becomes, hopefully, a true, truly public civic place, a square in the city, so to say. 
Which brings us to the second um, ingredient, which is the horizontal slab above, um, which would house the more traditional galleries. Of course, the more traditional galleries are not more traditional, but um, some of them might be. Um, and we always understood this as being a, a very diverse mix of different conditions, different lighting conditions, different materials, different scale, different proportion, different uh, materialization, different views, different ways the daylight comes into the space. And this is exactly the thing we have now been developing with the M plus curatorial team. And, and this is the latest layout we, we kind of um, settled in on for now, maybe only. Um, but basically, we still have this very clearly defined central plaza, which you come up from the escalators or from the auditorium stairs all the way from Victoria Harbor front, um, from which you can either look down or you pick basically one of these entries into, um, this is a rendering of the space with this bridge, um, into these different gallery suites. And again, they, like a city, you have to organize these in clusters. So it's the reconfigure space, it's four clusters, classical galleries, open galleries, a little bit similar like the reconfigurable one, and the brick galleries wrapping around the courtyard. So again, all four areas have a specific identity and character, and you can either only look at one of them or at all of them, or you can even look um, at the entire thing. And we will develop this further, but again, this will be a variety. This will be not only white box space, this will be all kind of things, black box, white box, um, no ceiling, ceiling, um, clearer story, um, top lid, side lid. Um, so it will be a very um, controlled, but diverse um, possibilities to show art, design, architecture, and moving image. And a very important role in navigation and circulation will play the way the daylight is brought into the space in the way you relate out to the view and to the surrounding neighborhoods. This is a working model. This is also nice. We do these really large scale models. They look a little bit fuzzy and gray and whitish for you, but um, Lars has experience and the others. We can quite easily rip around walls, make openings, uh, readjust everything with these kind of things. And they're truly working models. You know, nothing is set. Everything is open. Everything can be questioned. And this is exactly what we've been doing together with the client in the last months and weeks. This is the new auditorium connecting the ground floor with the upper floor. And everything which is red basically means you're in a zone, you're going to see the water. Um, on the other side, you have the galleries relating to the courtyard. The courtyard is not only a green courtyard now, it's, it's an interesting space in that regard that it will allow the people from the park to go through the courtyard all the way up onto the roof, so the roof becomes like an extension of uh, the Kowloon Park. And the other interesting thing is that part of this green courtyard will be the ink gallery, so you're still within the gallery, within the museum, but you're out in a separate volume, um, in a separate building almost, if you want, um, for the ink art, for viewing ink art. So this is the roof with a courtyard and all of this is accessible, including this is the cafe here. So you can actually, if you want, flow through this thing on the entire uh, roofscape. Which brings us to the, uh, to the last piece and then I'm also really done. Um, otherwise I'm gonna miss my flight probably. Which is the vertical element. We really think that the vertical element is a screen. Um, not only the screen which has been shown and described and debated and discussed before, which is the one which will transmit hopefully artistic content, but it's also a screen basically just showing what is inside the building. It's a very narrow building, it will be very transparent and you will see during daytime for example, that there are offices there, that are research spaces there, that are cafes there, it will be visible. Yeah. 
and this is for us very important. So basically what is inside is expressed on the outside. So that's a very literal translation of a screen. But we also felt this could be a perfect opportunity to use it as a screen. And this is now this idea of the billboard. But it's not um, something surface mounted. It actually is totally integrated into the architecture by this very simple um, off-the-shelf LED bands which are integrated into these um, louvers you will see, you see here, uh, which we need, as I said before, to keep the sun out and to keep the glazing as transparent as possible. So artistic content can be shown there and what we like about this is also the format. It's very different than the things happening behind and next to it and around and so on, which is typically always in the vertical. This is almost like a literal reminder of a cinema screen. It's almost like a Sugimoto photograph of an open air drive-in cinema. It is literally something um, in its character, in its proportion, and where it also sits in the city. It hovers just above ground, you know? It's not up in the air. It's very close to the ground. I think it will have already, because of that, a very different character. And of course, believe it or not, we have of course experimented with these ideas since years, if not decades. For example, for a competition in 91 for a cultural center in Blois in France, where we had the idea that not only the program, what is happening inside the building, will be on billboards on the facade, but also um, fragments of the text performed inside the building will be projected onto the facade and suddenly what is inside again is committed and communicated on the facade, on the building skin. And of course, another example, Schaulager in Basel, um, which is a storage building for a very important art collection and they do have a lot of video art and the idea was what do we do with the video art because um, wouldn't it be nice that this is always visible so also here at that time this is pretty much what you could afford as a billboard <laughs> um, two screens which constantly show um, basically um, pieces of their video art collection but the architecture is forming again also a cinemascope-like screen. So this is what we're doing right now, and this is the real stuff, so this is how this thing looks like, Colin. <laughs> I think it will not be out to date too soon, and if so, it doesn't matter, um, because the resolution is quite good. As we can see, it's almost like, a, like, a, like this projector, actually. Um, a little bit less good, but it's sharp, and it's precise, and this would be the view if you arrive, for example, by boat at the waterfront promenade and you would make the effort to look up, this is what you would see. And of course, when you would be far away, it would be even more um, uh, cleaner and crisper. So that leaves us basically with the most important discussion, which is what are we going to have on this screen and are we going to have artistic content on this? And, um, and we think this is a huge opportunity. It is really, the building is anchored in these two extremes. You have this rough found topography in the soil, in the ground of the site. And on the other hand, you are anchored in the skyline of Hong Kong, which are really the two, um, two most um, extreme positions you can get in the city. And um, also as a display space, maybe you have the two most extreme conditions there, one being very rough, and below ground and a topography, and the other one being a huge, enormous screen um, never heard of before. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Askin. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I love in the Tate Modern and also the, the turbine hall and the tanks. And now with M Plus, there's a real acknowledgement about what's already found, what's existing in the infrastructure, and looking very carefully at what's already there. And it's a new definition of the ground space. It's a city of like Hong Kong, we're always looking upwards, we're always looking towards the sky or the skyline. To finally look down and look into the earth is a very new experience. I believe we have time for just one question. Um, can we take a question from the audience? 
too late for questions. Perhaps. Uh, could I ask one? Oh, there's one from Colin. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's probably three. Lars tried to stop me because I've had enough air time as it is. <laughs> I apologize. I do have, I just wanted to thank you for this amazing presentation, which was for me extremely revealing, although I felt I knew everything about, about the project. But to go through a whole genealogy of, of your designs before coming to the, to the uh, M Plus, I think was amazingly revealing of a number of things. I just have Two, two questions, but not really, only one question, uh, which is that I restrained, uh, I refrained from mentioning this issue of a critique of a connection between the vertical and horizontal slabs. I'm just very happy that you have addressed it because it's one of the points we debated during your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I think it really, as you say, it really adds something to, the, to yeah. the concept. But my question related to that is, does it imply you carving into the floor space of some, the floor plates of some of these levels where the junction between horizontal and vertical comes? Are you, are you cutting back to some extent to create a possibility of seeing this, this, uh, this verticality? Yes, I, I thought it was visible on the rendering, but maybe it wasn't. I mean, basically, uh, you, you, you can now look all the way up even... I mean, actually, you would be able to see the screen now if you want to. You could be in the found space, look up through the ground floor plane, through the gallery podium level, through the narrow roof light, and then you would see the entire vertical billboard, so to say, of the tower screen above. So. It is actually literally a cross section through the entire building. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. We really appreciate it. Thank you.